very pleasant afternoon, everybody. Afternoon. Okay, so, well, our topic today is actually very interesting, but unfortunately, this topic is very, very common. But what I'm going to discuss today is a new approach or a novel approach, and this one is what we call now as a funny modeling. As you all know, when you talk about livestock waste management in the Philippines, for instance, this is already very, very common. But what is in common for us is to explore new methods in analyzing this so that we can come up also with new ways to solve these problems. But before the details of the project, allow me to go back to these ecological time-space scales. This is very important to go back because when you talk about environmental governance, it's actually an issue about the scale. And then for us to fully understand the scale of any environmental problem, we have to go back into that time and also on the space scale. So in, with, with regards to pollution generation, for instance, such as in the entity of swine operators, we have to understand that their operation actually happens at the individual scale. So you and I, when we throw waste, for instance, that operation of throwing waste happens at the individual scale. The decision of throwing or reducing the discharges, for instance, that one happens at the individual decision-making process. However, when you talk about pollution, an environmental problem, such as pollution, that one occurs at the higher scale that is way beyond the individual scale. So therefore, it is very important for us to analyze the connection between what happens or what is being done at the individual scale and how this manifests at the larger scale, such as in the case of livestock waste management and in the case of river pollution. So specifically, if you want to understand river pollution, what we are actually facing is complexity and chaos. These are important key words for us to accept. You know, When you are dealing with environmental problems, you can't help but there is that inherent complexity. This inherent complexity actually is a product of the geospatial nature, the political nature. You also have to embed in there in your analysis the institutional and the social complexities. And these actually, okay, these complexities actually occur across different scales. So therefore, if we're trying to understand a very complex environmental problem, we need to also realize that we, are, we need to involve in there multi or multiple stakeholders. And in each of these multiple stakeholders, of course, there are various interests, and there are various uh, motivations. And then these motivations may lead to conflicting interests. For instance, economic growth versus environmental integrity. You know, there, these are different uh, motivations these are different interests. On the other hand, you can help but also look into the discrepancies, particularly in technical, infrastructural, and funding capacities. There are disparities with regards to these across different entities. And then the other one is the differentiating access and availability of ecosystem services in the upstream and in the downstream. All of these directly and directly contribute to the complexity and in the chaos of river pollution. Well, one, one case would be different from another case because the combinations of these factors would contribute to a specific characteristic and this is what you call as the emergent properties. So perhaps we can understand pollution in Batangas, a uh, river in Batangas, or pollution, for instance, in a river in Euro. You know, you can understand a number of these factors, but the manifestation would vary to some extent because of the peculiarity of the conditions. So for instance, the emergent properties in the river pollution phenomenon would be brought about by manifestation of a river basin wide effluent loading from several resources. Meaning the point source of these would vary. The types of the source of pollution would also vary depending on the location. And then what is also very important is the change in consumption pattern and on the population growth characteristics. So this would directly or directly contribute to the emergent, of, uh, the emergent properties of that particular scale. So in any ecological dynamics, such as in the case of the environmental problem, the change there is gradual and slow. So for instance, when you throw waste today, the manifestation of, as to how that contributes to a pollution at a larger scale, actually, there is a clear time lag in there. 
such that it would be very difficult for us to look into the attribution of that effect to its particular cause. In one way or the other, it contributes to the complexity, the inner complexity in dealing with environmental problems. Specifically, uh, when, you, when you look into the effects uh, on river pollution, the effects there would tend to accumulate and evolve over time. Now, how can we collectively come up with that mind, collective mind, where we can fully understand this long process of pollution? You know? That is, of course, very challenging when, in fact, the very cause of the problem lies at the individuals. This scenarios that I was describing actually is the point of interest in the Kalumpang River Basin. The Kalumpang River Basin is located in Batangas province. In Batangas province, you have two cities in there, and then you have six municipalities. What is shown to you here is the entire river basin, or the Kalumpang River Basin. And in the Kalumpang River Basin, you have in there the major river, and this is called the Kalumpang River. In here, it is important to understand the complexities with regards to the composition in terms of the, the local government units that comprise this river basin. For instance, the manifestation of pollution might be greatly felt at the downstream portion, such as in the case of Batanga City. So the people in there, or the, or the community in there, are complaining about the pollution. But if you're going to analyze the source of the pollution, these emanate from other local government units located at the upstream or the midstream portion of this watershed. So you have here the total area of the Kalumpang River Basin, you have the catchment area also, and then the stream length of Kalumpang River, which is about 27.2 kilometers. So this is our system. If you're going to fully understand our system, you can clearly, uh, you can clearly see in there a story. And in that story, is specifically seen uh, when you look into the trend on land use and cover change. So in here, what is very clear, if we're going to take a look at what happened in terms of the trend on the land use and cover, in here, it is very clear that the orange here, this one are the urban areas. Across years, okay, across years, it's clear that there really is the expansion of the urban areas in this specific river basin. And here, along with these increasing areas of, or increasing rate of urbanization, are of course these areas, these areas for agriculture, you know, the gray portion of our, of our figure. Now, what is also important to understand is not just what happened on the space. Other than looking into the absolute number of these, for instance, you have to also couple that with, the, with an understanding on the consumption patterns. Um, in the consumption patterns, for instance, there is clearly this demand shift in livestock products. While what I am presenting here are the global, such as in the case of Southeast Asia, developing and developed world um, data, these clearly can be seen in the case of local condition in the Philippines. Further, for us to understand the pollution problem in Batangas River, or sorry, in Kalumpang River, let's take a look at the data. This data, uh, particularly on water quality, you have in there several parameters. By the way, this particular data was collected by SESAM students. So in here, you can, you can see in there some parameters, such as BOD, ESS, dissolved oxygen. And here for this particular river, which is classified as C, in here, a number of these areas or something sites in this river are actually, well, the, the number there is way beyond uh, the standard for this specific river, such as in the case of DOD and dissolved oxygen. Indeed, in here, we wanted to establish that there is concern about water pollution with regards to water quality specifically in Kalumpang River. If we're going to analyze the factors that perhaps contribute to this water quality degradation in the river, we can end up looking to the major industry in the area. And from 2003 to 2013 data, in here you have this increase in number of farms and swine population. If you visit in the area, of course, you can clearly see 
how important bucket farming or the swine operation to the poultry farming in this particular area. In the data for 2013, there, the number of swine, the number of heads, okay, is estimated to be about 387,293. And you have more than 7 million for the case of poultry. In here, in this particular local economy, there is a substantial contribution on swine and poultry um, industry or sectors. Now, you have in there very nature, very, uh, very, the very nature, the very characteristic of our study site. Then you also have in there the activities, such as in the case of swine and poultry operation. Indeed, there is this complexity and chaos in river pollution. But if we're going to fully analyze this, you know, we have a number of those approaches, but we deem it necessary that the best way to take a look into this, okay, the best, that the best approach to take a look into this, is what we call a transdisciplinary approach. Now, the question is, while this transdisciplinary approach is very good, how can we then operationalize this? And then how can we then apply this or operationalize this in the case of Kalumpang River? And of course, this is the kind of framework that we used or we employed in this specific study. In any study that we are doing, the question will always be, okay, what is the purpose of that study? What is the objective? In here, what then is the purpose of that transdisciplinary research? How you answer this particular question would depend, would, would, would tell us what type of research we would be doing or what type of transdisciplinary research we are doing. In here, if you want to develop an understanding that counts for complexity and, and diversity, what you are after for actually is this encyclopedic understanding. And here, what is inherent is the need to integrate all those disciplines. The other very important purpose of why we're doing transdisciplinary researches is to develop solutions to societal problems. This is a very important um, question that we need to also pursue. And in here, we need to also consider the risks and the unintended consequences of solutions. So while we have understanding on the theoretical aspect of it, we need to also dwell on the practical aspect of the question. In here, what is important for us to do is the combination of these scientific bodies of knowledge along with what you call as non-scientific body of knowledge. In here, this is what you call as the holistic understanding, meaning we'll integrate all those scientific knowledge or bodies. And the other part is problem solving. That is on the practical side. When you work for local government units, for instance, or when you are a decision maker for LGUs or for a national government, you do not just simply ask questions on how to integrate knowledge. But the far more important question that they are asking actually is how to solve an environmental problem. Okay. Just to somehow uh, make sure that we have a clear understanding on the classification of the approaches, this is what you call as the trans or the disciplinarity research. On this side, this is what you call as multidisciplinary research. You have a clear objective in there. And then you bring in together a number of these disciplines, but they look at the objectives separate from each other. In the case of interdisciplinary research, you have all these, you have a clear objective or a set of objectives, and then you have a number of these disciplines together, but all of these disciplines interact with each other. What is far more important and very much relevant in the case of the environmental problem is these transdisciplinary, transdisciplinary research or transdisciplinary research. You have a number of these disciplines interacting fully and then they have a unified understanding of that set of objectives. In an environmental problem, such as in the case of the river pollution in Calabang River, what is clearly required is transdisciplinary research. Okay, how do we operationalize this in the case of the river pollution in Calabang River? We bring in together a number of a number of individuals coming from different disciplines, from environmental science, from economics, from anthropology, all of these together form part our research team. And actually some of them are here with me. So we have Dean, and then we have Clarissa, and we have the rest of the members who, well, 
Yeah, they are members of this team, and unfortunately, not all, all of them uh, were able to attend our activities today. Okay. Now, if we would be pursuing transdisciplinary research, what does it entail? It must be, of course, scientific. What is very important in there, especially if you're going to pursue problem-solving um, aspect of it, is the participatory aspect. And the other one is adaptive nature, and then it must encourage partnership, and it must facilitate active learning process. Okay? While it's saying, when we do our respective studies, uh, disciplinary approaches, employing disciplinary approaches, we perhaps focus on one or two or combinations of these. But in a transdisciplinary research, we have combinations of all of these characteristics. Now, there is a specific framework that we employ in operationalizing transdisciplinary research. And this is what you call as companion modeling. So this is the framework that we use to operationalize a transdisciplinary research, to really make it happen. In a companion modeling framework, what is required in there is a co-management partnership, okay, which is very much um, reflective of this participatory and partnership. And then you have to combine that with adaptive management. So uh, in here, the characteristic there is flexibility. And then you need to accompany that with the modeling process. Okay, we need to accompany it with the modeling process. In a number of the participatory research before, what happened there actually was purely, well, if we're going to take a look at the characteristic of um, interdisciplinary research in the Philippines, what, what, usually can, what you can usually read actually is descriptive type of studies, well, particularly on stakeholder analysis. Now the question is, can we somehow level up that descriptive stakeholder analysis with a far more empirical approaches? Now, you can do that by employing combined modeling and by accompanying all of these characteristics with the modeling aspect. Okay, in here, what is shown is, you know, um, just to, well, these are the slides to show how we operationalize our research. You and I, when you look at the specific system, there are agents in there. Okay, these are your stakeholders, or these are your interest groups or individuals. And then each of these agents would have their own representations of a shared environment or a common environment. And this could be layered. Okay? This could be layered. Now what we want is to combine all of these so you have that perspective from the researcher, you have also the perspective from the manager, and you have the perspective from your other stakeholders. Can we, can we come up with a shared perspective or analysis of this particular system? You can never do that unless you will do participatory approaches, participatory mapping, and participatory modeling. The next part is the participatory modeling uh, for what you call as co-designing because you want to achieve a shared representation. So in here, this is an example of like people coming together, your, your stakeholders, analyzing the specific problem or analyzing a solution for that particular problem. You have a clear approach how to go about the process and then eventually you have this shared representation of the problem, encompassing different aspects of the problem. What we want here is a conceptual model of a sociological or socio-ecological interactions at a particular given system. Okay, what are the steps uh, that we need to do to operationalize this? In a companion modeling framework, in here, you design a research question, you define methods, and then you must ensure that there is this risk, conflict, and tensions between and among your participants. This follows an iterative process. A companion modeling would start from problem identification, and then you have in there your, your participants. So you have your problem identification. In this case, you have river pollution for Kalumpang River. And then you must engage them in a number of approaches so that we will be able to come up with a participatory analysis of the problem. 
And then this uh, conceptual analysis of the problem will be the input for the co-building of the simulation, okay, or the conceptual model. And then you will do participatory simulations of that model. And then you come up with new questions or problems alongside with other actors if that is being necessary. This is an iterative process until such time, until such time that the people will agree that they have now a unified understanding of what the problem is and how it can be solved. So what we operationalize here actually is from conceptual modeling to agent-based simulations to scenario assessment. Okay? If your solutions have been identified, how will it work across different scenarios? Okay, on the steps, on the specific approaches, what you can do actually, or some of the steps that you can employ, is influence importance matrix. So once you do stakeholder analysis, which is very much important in your combined modeling, you can employ influence importance matrix. The other one, in your focus group discussions, you can subject your stakeholders on bar D, problem, actors, resources, dynamics, and interactions. The other one is all of these, you know, so when you do focus group discussions, if you stop only up to here, what you can have could maybe be, uh, it could be about a descriptive analysis of the problem. But in a combined modeling, you need to pursue or you need to go beyond. So these products in your party, you need to construct a unified modeling language diagrams, or what we call as the UML diagrams. And then in here, after these UML diagrams, you proceed to role-playing games. And in your role-playing games, what is very much important in there is the need for you to really understand the typologies of your stakeholders. While you may need not to bring all the 100% attendance of your stakeholders on, on one meeting, but what is important for you to ensure is that each of the typologies of your stakeholder must be represented in these role-playing games. Now, we're already at the stage of, let's say, we're already at the stage of clarifying who are our stakeholders. And they will be the ones that will help us in understanding the problem and also in identifying solutions. Once we've already identified solutions, that must also be anchored on a clear policy. You can proceed to doing role-playing games. A role-playing game can be done on a field. So this is what you call a field-based simulation, meaning you will allow or you will conduct a role-playing games okay, participated in by your, your, your stakeholders. On the other hand, you can also do simulations, but what you call, this is what you call as laboratory-based simulations. Meaning you can come up with your own scenarios but you can do this at the laboratory. Okay? Let's say, for instance, if you have additional scenarios that you've thought of, since you know you knew already the characteristic of your stakeholders, you can then do laboratory-based simulations. Okay. In here, the very argument why this participatory research is very important, especially in environmental problems, and in coming up with solutions for environmental problems, is Ownership. Gun, well, gun are the days, supposedly, that we as researchers go to the field and simply collect the data and then go back to our respective units and then come up with our own papers. Now, what is very much important is to fully engage the people, you know, the various stakeholders that are really into the environmental problem that we're trying to understand. So, if we engage our stakeholders early on, in identifying the problems and analyzing the problems and in understanding and identifying the solutions to the problem, what we can ensure is the ownership. To summarize, a companion modeling would actually cover all of these objectives. Okay? It's a long process, six to one year. You have the objectives in here, conceptualization, the validation of the problem, and then you engage your stakeholders uh, about common process so that they will be informed about the entire steps. And then you will analyze the stakeholders. You will evaluate, um, evaluate the feasibility of the proposed policy reforms or other interventions, so on and so forth. 
in here, the blue here actually are your survey on the problem. The blue ones are the survey of the problem. The orange is the con conception of the model. Meaning, you cannot just come up with one model, but since this is iterative, you can redo this model as deemed important by your stakeholders. So you have different versions of your human man. And then the other one is participatory simulations. This is, these are the green ones, the green boxes. And then the last one is the workshop and report uh, preparations. So these are your objectives as per your common. These are your methods. And then these are your outputs from UML version 1 to version 2 to version 3 to your party analysis down to Kalimpang River Basin model. Okay, from something that is very conceptual to something that is that, that could be analyzed in a very empirical way. Specifically, we applied that modeling process in the case of livestock waste management, which is very much necessary to be put up so that we can institute a river, pollution, river rehabilitation program in Kalimpang River. So just uh, some pictures to show you the activities we did. We have these iterative workshops from March 2014 to March 2015. We did a number of key informants interviews. We also did training program on integrated river basin co-management. You know why we did this? Because in here, we want to ensure that we have participants for data collection. And the best way to do that is in the morning, there is training. And in the afternoon, there is data collection process. So in the training, we did the inputting in the morning. And then for the data collection process and the, ex and the exercises, you do the data collection process for, for the research. And then validation of the modeler's UML diagram to a number of key informants. And then you do workshop for influence importance matrix. As researchers, what we do really is to simply facilitate the entire research. We are participants in this entire scheme. And the result, this is your influence importance matrix of the key stakeholders in Kalumpang River Basin. This can be categorized in terms of low influence and high importance and high importance or in terms of importance and influence based on their perception. What is very important for us to see are these groups of stakeholders. So in here you have different types or different stakeholders clearly represented from executive branch of the government to legislative to CSOs and several other groups. Okay. And then of course you have the informal settlers in there and then academia is also being represented. But these are group or these are clustered depending on their importance and depending on their um, influence. What is the importance of these um, what is the importance of these influence importance matrix? The time that we will be coming up with a solution, okay, it is very important to look into who really are the very ones that we can ask help from. Okay? And then we will be informed by these specific matrix. The other one is the party workshop. In a party workshop, you have to, from the very beginning, analyze the problem together. We need to fully understand first how, how our stakeholders on the ground really look into river pollution. If they are not convinced there is river pollution in Kalumpang River, we can never join them to participate in our um, problem solving exercises. So what, what we're happy about is that there is a consensus about the existing problem, specifically in water pollution in Kalumpang River. In there, we ask them to identify the actors, and then what are the resources of these actors, and then the dynamics governs the use of these resources by each of these actors. And how, and how each of these actors, the stakeholders, interact to each other. So this is your party. In here, we validated the party diagram. This is our version number two. In here, these are your business establishments. These are your national agencies. These are your provincial and then the uh, municipality, meaning this is the local government specifically. We have the legislative in there and the executive. There is also the presence of non-government organization. You have in here your households and then the informal settlers or the residents in there. 
And then you have the academe. These are your actors, okay? Within the context of the problem. In each of these actors, they have a specific resource. And then the interactions in there actually is being shown by these arrows. So in here, this one, this particular figure is very telling. You know who they are, you know what they have, and you will know how they interact within the context of river pollution in Anupam River. This one must be converted into a UML. So this, this is the UML version of that particular um, party model. Once this is ready, well, this, this was done by our um, computer scientists. This one will enable us to do the modeling process. And that is specifically done by agent-based simulations. These agent-based simulations, of course, would include the role-playing games. We, have a num we did a number of these role-playing games. This was participated by local government representatives. Swan and poultry racers in a specific barangay. And then we let them do their role playing games in a specific scenario. One is the status quo, and then one is the institutionalization of payments for ecosystem services. Okay. So there's an incentive based mechanism. In the laboratory based simulation, okay, we did Monte Carlo simulation uh, using Net Logo, and then we added additional scenarios. In here, on, in addition to status quo and then the PES, we explored a centralized weight treatment facility that can be constructed, and also a farm level biogas digesters. Okay, these scenarios actually uh, were raised by the stakeholders themselves. Well, of course, as researchers, we have an understanding of what could be the likely scenarios. But we, what we want to ensure is that there is a clear ownership of this, and this must be coming from them. In a role-playing game, what you can use there is a board game. Okay? So this is an example of the board game. And then this board game actually was used for the field-based simulation. You have a number of those, um, a number of those participants. And each of these participants would have different attributes, and then they have different operations. This one is a representation of a specific land use in that area, okay? And then you can assign, you can assign a specific um, layer on each of these cells, and each of these cells will represent a specific land use or land cover: farms, forest, river, welcome area, crops, and a vacant cell. Now, in here, each of these layer okay, would perform a specific attribute. Okay. Okay, so each of that cell in our board game is actually uh, would have a specific attribute. This attribute would include scale, um, cell, compliance, mitigation, knowledge, operation, number of heads, income, and discharge. Okay. So you have these specific attributes. What you are doing is you want to see how this will change across different scenarios. And you have a number of these possible values. What can a stakeholder do, okay, a player do? Um, in here, you have operation. A player can set up biogas register. They can also set up waste treatment, so on and so forth. Meaning, there is a clear operation that a specific operator can do. And then this is not hypothetical. This is clearly based on what is happening on the ground. Now, if you have 10 players here, you have 10 players, what we are interested is to see what would happen to their income and then what would happen to their to their waste volume. We are trying to come up or to identify a scenario wherein, of course, a scenario that would ensure that environment will be protected but income will not be sacrificed. Meaning, can we come up with a scenario wherein the production for the swine operation will still continue, but we will allow our swine and poultry operators the opportunity to reduce their wastes. So in here, you have these 10 players, and under these field-based scenarios, you have two scenarios, status quo and then the institutionalization of a PES. Now what is clear really in here 
is a trade-off between increasing profit and abating pollution. You can clearly observe how one would operate because they will clearly do a trading off. Sometimes one would be more uh, more for income, but unfortunately that would also would mean that there is an increase in waste volume generation. Okay, on the lab-based simulation, the lab-based simulation you have you have to, we still look into waste volume generation and then the swine farm income. And this is the two variables that we were very much interested in. And then we used a number of the scenarios. You have the status quo, you have the centralized waste, farm level biogas, and then a PES. In all of these scenarios, it's very clear, in terms of waste volume generation, waste generation is increasing. Clearly, all of these are increasing, meaning Okay, whatever you do, there is a tendency or high probability that waste generation will continue to increase. But if we get to take a look at the average rate of change per year, so this is from 0 to 25 year iteration for Roman Picard, what is clearly observed is there is this average rate of change per year. And these are not the same across scenarios. So what you want to see is which of these particular scenarios these scenarios would give us the least waste volume generation. And you can clearly observe that in here, the in this case, you have your farm level biogas digester. How about for the swine farm income? In the swine farm income also, is it already five? No more electricity? Okay, so you have here these scenarios, and in here it's opposite. The more of the income, the better it would be for us. Okay, a fast track. In terms of the results of our scenarios, for us, the most effective would be farm level biogas digester if your criteria is for waste generation, the reduction of waste generation. In the case of income, okay, so this is for the waste. In the case of income, you have also these centralized waste treatment facilities. Okay, um, this would reduce the average rate of increase in waste volume by 0 0.0987 per year. In the, in the case of PES also, this has high potential to mitigate the average rate of increase of waste volume. At the same time, this can also, uh, but the average rate of change of income from swine operations would range from 0.7 per year compared to the status quo. So PES would be a good one or a good option for this. Now, just to summarize our results, you know, there is clearly an implication for this for river rehabilitation. The very stumbling block for us is the complete list of swine farms. You know? We wanted to have a good understanding of the topologies. But if you want to have, if you want to determine the entire universe of swan operation, unfortunately, you cannot come up with a complete listing of this. And alongside with this, there's a need for um, awareness raising, uh, particularly adaptive, and an appropriate dissemination of a simple explanation about the disruption of, let's say, how a swan operation will contribute to water pollution or river pollution. There's a less understanding with regards to such relationship. And then, of course, just to emphasize, there is a need for the support from the political leaders. Um, if you are pursuing biogas digester, the case of the biogas digester, which in our, in, our, in our simulation, that one is one of the best option, this one will be shouldered by uh, the swan operators themselves. So therefore, the government could somehow get an idea that they must come up with mechanisms, technology-wise or financially-wise, that they can assist our operators so that they can institute biogas digesters by themselves. Okay, so if you will be interested in common, as per our learning in, in the case of our experience, we are happy to share that common indeed is a good methodological framework. Okay. It, it, 
it is a very good framework that combines all of those aspects so that you can really operationalize transdisciplinary research. Since you engage in there all the necessary stakeholders, you can ensure to some extent that there is ownership of what transpires in the case in, in the entire process. And then you are there, of course, a scientist, but you don't just go there as if you you know everything, you're omniscient. No. But at least you engage in there your stakeholders and there is an active learning process. And since you're talking about the problem and then you let your stakeholders discuss about it, you are ensured that there is increased in, in the case of awareness on that problem. And then it is it is worthwhile to know that while we are doing our research, the research will then become a platform for the discussion of that problem and then the analysis of what could work to solve the problem. And then that could also um, address potential conflict. And since early on, okay, if you if you will realize that there is a need to operationalize, let's say, inter-LGU um, body to solve this problem or this pollution problem, since you engage them early on, there is this potential um, minimized transaction cost to get the people organized or to get, let's say, LGUs organized by themselves. So there's a reduction in transaction cost. These are some of our learnings from the compiling modeling process that we did. And for sure, there are a number of benefits that a part of the research would give us. Okay, just one last slide. There will be an international training workshop on compiling modeling. And this will be happening on October 16 to 18, 2015, here in University of the Philippines, Los Banos. So this one will be uh, given to us by CIRAD and then by the Greece Research Network and then the, embassy, uh, the French Embassy in Manila and then also by UPLB. So the trainers actually will be coming from CIRAD and hopefully by that time our publication okay, from this research will come out, hopefully. So we can, we would be very happy if you would be interested to also signify your interest to join. It will be on October this particular year. So that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Paul, for that very uh, that highly informative presentation. Um, the floor is now open for your questions, insights, or comments. Yes. Good afternoon, Dr. Ampo, and thank you very much for the presentation. Um, transdisciplinarity is always something that is aimed for by many researchers. However, it is quite difficult to achieve, and even in, on paper, it looks quite difficult, and more especially so when you do it operation, operationally. I have a couple of questions in relation to the process. One is, um, you mentioned the time frame of six, to one, six months to one year. Did that, um, did that cover the whole thing from, sorry, the writing was, was quite small, and I, you know, I'm getting old, so I can't read very well. So uh, you started from the surveys and all these kinds of things up to the UML, up to the model, and that took just a year? Yes. Really? Yes. Yeah. Congratulations to the team if you were able to accomplish that in a year. Okay. But uh, let me... Uh, in the course of that year, you had the same actors all throughout. There was no loss of interest in any of the activities. You had, you were able to, to sustain the interest of the communities, of your actors? Okay, that's a very good question because when you do participate in research, you want to make sure that you have participants in your research exercises. The very reason why we did training, you know, uh, we came up with a training and all our target participants, uh, target participants for research, were involved in that training so that we can really ensure the participation from start to finish. Um, if you would just simply invite them so that they will give, they will participate in a party workshop and so on, for sure the next time around they won't be coming. But what we did to ensure that they will be participating the entire data collection process, we coupled it with a training program. And at the end of the training program, they have certificates, etc. So 
at least there was an incentive for their part. So that was just one training program in which you were able to get the, 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 the information that you needed? Yes. Okay, so it wasn't a series of uh, trainings, a series of activities where the, the actors had to be there? No, no. It, was, it was a series of trainings actually. Yeah. There were several meetings and these several meetings uh, were they fall under the training program. Okay, okay. I won't belabor the point, but there's another uh, point of curiosity for me. Mm. There must have been some conflicts in the de definition of your problem and the possible solutions uh, among researchers, among the modelers, and among the community members. Whose views prevailed? Okay, um, like between researchers, for instance, and then between between because you had, the, you had them all together. So you had the community members, you had the researchers, the experts. Yes, yes. So whose views prevailed when it came to finally, you know, deciding on how to describe something and how to go about solving the problem? Actually, that's that's a very good question because remember about the party framework that we used? The first there was problem. And fortunately, the identification of what a problem is, you know, the very moment we presented in there what a problem is, there was a conflict as to the definitions. Okay. In, in there, as, our, as, our, as researchers, what the team did actually is we include, we simply documented how, I mean, the entire process. We allowed them to think through how, how they define the problem. But what you can do is, in, in our case, since we are very much interested in river pollution, we did some inputting process, okay, some inputting process that is coming from our researchers. So that this we can facilitate our stakeholders or our participants in really looking into the river pollution problem. We didn't directly tell them that there is river pollution problem, but we just stated the facts. There was an inputting process. And then the next time around, they realized it themselves. There will be potential conflicts. Uh, you can't help but, of course, have all of these. What is needed for us to do is to document all of these, at the very least, as to which, um, as to which um, perspective uh, would, would be well, the supreme one. Well, it will follow. Uh, you just really have to proceed with the exercises, and later on you can you can identify the, the identify, you can analyze the identified solutions will depend on whose perspective really prevail. One final question. It's about the impact. I missed the introduction to your I was late, I'm sorry. Um, I'm not exactly sure where the project ended and if there are already impacts. Uh, you just did the modeling. Mm. Oh, okay. So it ended there. Nothing has been uh, Undertaken yet? Implemented? Nothing. Okay, nothing. Oh, okay. Okay. So that's okay. I'll how how you wish that let's say after after the project we, it would have been nice if let's say the the identified um, best intervention could have been implemented and then see whether or not it works on on the ground. Unfortunately, we don't have um, additional funds for that. Or our TOR only covers the analysis. Thank you. Well, I hope we have funding for the next phase so that we can really you know, uh, weave together from the start to the end of the whole thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes. Okay. Can I make it yourself? Nice presentation, Dr. Ampo. Uh, I'm Dave from CESA. Uh, in relation to Mamiria's um, comment, uh, were there plans uh, since you have already modeled and identified that they're interested in by the, or instituting a common uh, biogas yes. register, uh, were there, have you heard of any plans? I mean, right after they, you have um, discovered that that was the plan, were there any um, like plans to purchase or construct? Since that would already indicate that, that indeed follow the uh, model's expectations. Actually, there are, let's say, putting up um, biogas suggestions are actually happening. On the side of the Lopagami unit, what, what they are asking is whether they're going to really invest a substantial amount so that 
it will be ensured that all of the operators, so operators will really be able to put up virus digesters. Okay? So there is, on the side of the local government, yes, there is already that interest. As to whether that would make sense, if there is a clear basis for them to really invest in it, that one, that, that's a question that they are asking. So in, in our research, we were able to answer that. So, when, so if in case the LGU of Batangas would put up some money so that all of the solid creators will have biosuggestors, they have a clear research anchorage to justify such, such action. What is lacking in our analysis is, wait, um, there may be that intervention from the LGU, but down the line, let's say if you know, the decision to put up biosuggestors or not is actually at the individual level. And perhaps there is a need for more in-depth study to really understand what are the determinants and what are the barriers for an operator to institute biogas register or, or not. Because in our scenario, in our analysis, that one is one of the best um, options to take. Yes, um, there are owners or operators that really, they, and in our simulation, yes, uh, they wanted uh, biogas digesters. Okay. Okay. Unfortunately, there were a number of operators already having biogas digesters, but unfortunately, it didn't work that much. Okay. While in our analysis, we want biogas digesters, okay, because it's very cost-effective, but we were told that, you know, for several years ago, we already told them to put the biogas digesters, but unfortunately, it didn't really materialize. Why is that? So my answer to your question is, while it's clear that biogas digester is good, as to whether an individual operator will really do it or not, that is that, that's beyond um, the study. So perhaps a general study in the future could be done on that specific matter. Yes. Good afternoon. Thank you for the presentation. My question is with regards to the modeling process. And I think the parameterization part wasn't discussed. Can you uh, please enlighten me on that part? Like, for example, what values did you put on, the, on each parameter so that you were able to come up with the result? Okay. In here, actually, if you're going to take a look at this particular figure, So in here, you have your attributes. So you have your scale, your cells, compliance. And actually, these are your description for or the type. You know, these are ways to really quantify okay, your, your parameters. So let's talk about discharge, for instance. In a discharge, like this one, right? So in the discharge, for instance, for what? Let me, let me look for that particular graph. Okay. I guess this is it. So in here, we have a clear basis on our quantification. Let's say, for instance, for the discharge, we knew the coefficients. Uh, we based that on n graph. So we collected the number of heads for instance, and then we multiply that with the end graph because we didn't do study on, let's say, per head, like prim uh, primary study on, in these number of heads, you really have actual discharges. But we knew that there's a coefficient already, like somebody did that study before, so we used that specific study so that for the case of discharge, as an example, you have a clear quantification of your problem. Now, of this particular parameter. And then the same with income. In, here, in our income, you say you have the number of heads. We already know, by, after doing another research, that per head, you will have a specific income this much. So you can multiply them. Uh, you use that. Uh, so we use that in our case. So it's complete um, real problem uh, number. 
And then the number of deaths, these are actual values as well, along with other, other parameters. So we, we used actual data uh, in, in our simulations. 